Hello everyone, this is Dr. Vishal Trivedi from Department of Biosciences and Bioengineering IIT Guwahati. And in the course Enzyme Science and Technology, we are discussing about the different aspects of the enzyme. Uh, so what we were discussing, we were discussing about the crystallizations, right? So in the next step is you are actually going to use these crystals for diffraction data collection. So diffraction data collection is a multi-step process. In the first step, you are actually going to use, so within the diffraction data collections, first you are going to mount the crystals, right? The mounting of the crystals can be done by two methods. One is called as the capillary mounting and the second one is called as loop mounting, okay? so. Capillary mounting is a slightly older method where uh, people are, you know, putting the uh, crystal into a capillary. So you can imagine that I have sucked the crystals from the drop. So what I, what what you are going to do in the mounting of the crystal is that you are going to open the crystal and the uh, the you know cover slips, right? So once you open the cover slip, you are going to see a drop, and in these drops you have the crystals, right? So first you are going to do is you are going to wash this drop and then you are actually going to isolate the uh, crystals right and then uh, these crystals uh, can be placed either into the capillary uh, or in the loop so in the capillary what you have is you have a capillary like glass capillary right so glass capillary you can just place the crystals right and you can place uh, some amount of the mother right mother liquor right so you can actually be able to place some amount of uh, mother liquor and then it has to be sealed from both the ends or both the sides with the help of the clay and then this you can actually be able to use for mounting whereas in comparison to this when the, you are going to do the loop mounting you are going to have a rod on which you are actually going to have the loop and this loop you can be able to place the crystal in between okay now loop mounting is requiring uh, additional infrastructure where you are actually requiring the liquid nitrogen uh, system right so that your crystal is going to be at a very high uh, low temperature. So that is uh, beneficial because it actually increases the viability of the temperature and viability of the your crystal because when the crystal is going to face you know the x-rays it is actually also developed some kind of uh, breakdowns and if you keep it in a very very low temperature like the liquid nitrogen temperature it is going to reduce the damages now in the step two you are actually going to collect the uh, first frame okay so once you collect the first frame that actually will allow you to calculate the space group and it's also going to calculate the symmetry so once you calculate the symmetry and the space group, it is actually going to allow or it will actually going to tell you that how many frames of data you are supposed to collect, right? So you can imagine that if I have the crystal and if I have the two-fold symmetry or three-fold symmetry and four-fold symmetry and all that, I can be able to collect the data accordingly. So once you collected that data, the third step is that you are also have going to add the frames after frames, right? So you can actually, for example, if I have collected the 90 frames, right? So what I'll do is I'll take the 1 to 10 frames, I will, you know, add them so that I am going to have the data of 1 to 10 frames. Similarly, from 11 to 20, I will add it into another 10, right? So that's how all the frames data you are supposed to collect. And I'm not showing you the X-ray machine or X-ray place, but all these mounting has to be done on a goinometer, right? And the goinometer is a place where, which is actually going to be parallel, which is going to be perpendicular to the X-ray and that's how X-ray is going to uh, illuminate the uh, X crystals. Once you collect the first frame, you are actually going to get the diffraction data how the diffraction data will look like, right? So this is the diffraction data, what you are going to look like. What you see here is in the center, this is actually called as uh, beam stop, okay? So in the machine, you are actually having a beam stop, which will not allow the undiffracted 
X-ray beam to hit the uh, tech detector actually. And you see this rod, right? So that is the beam stop actually. So it has a rod and then in front of that there is a stop, right? So that is not going to allow the X-rays to hit the, uh, the detector because if that happens, it is actually going to affect the brightness and contrast of the detector and also going to detect. So what you see in these black color spots, all these are actually the diffracted rays which are falling onto the detectors and all these, this picture is also being provided by the uh, Professor Shankar Prasad Karnojiya from our department only. And uh, the big, so what you see here is that this is the origin of the diffraction pattern, right? And as you move towards this side, it is actually going to tell you that how good the diffraction you are getting. So as long as you are getting the diffraction pattern, that means the resolution is bigger and bigger and higher and this diffraction is good actually. So you see all the spots are discrete, all the spots are not merged. In some cases what you will see is that the one spot and you are getting the second spot. That is actually going to create trouble when you are going to do with the structure solutions because it is actually going to interfere in terms of uh, preparing the uh, electron density map. Now the second step uh, we are going to go with the structure solutions, okay. So in the structure solution what you are going to get, what you are going to do is you are going to have the X-ray uh, diffraction data, right. Now this diffraction data is going to be processed, right, and ultimately it is actually going to allow you to generate the electron density map, right. And there are many uh, method or many approaches what you can actually be able to use for structure solutions. So you can actually be able to use the molecular replacement or MR, right, uh, which is called MR, right. So these are these are the molecular replacement approach which is only for the protein. If if you are if you are suppose solving a protein which is homologous to the existing protein in the protein structure database. So this is actually uh, for the homologous proteins, okay. Uh, I am not going to deal in detail about any of these methods because they itself are, you know, very big. Then you can also use the uh, MIR and that is actually where you are actually going to prepare the heavy uh, metal uh, complexes, right, of the protein and it is actually going to allow you. And then you also can use the uh, MAD or the multiple anomalous diffraction and that there you are actually going to use the uh, instead of using the X-ray you are going to use the synchrotron source and uh, it is actually going to use for you know varying the X-ray uh, wavelengths and that is how it is actually going to help you in terms of the solving the phase problem and it is also going to help you in terms of developing the electron density map. Now, Either of these methods depend on the what is the condition where if you are having a homologous protein you can use the molecular replacement. If you are working with the new protein and the new fold then you have no choice but to either try out the MIR method or the MAD method. So after that you are going to have the electron density map after these structure solutions right. And then how the electron density map will look like, right? So electron density map will look like uh, as a kind of a web-like structure which is surrounding the protein. So this is what you see here is uh, electron density map of the different si protein side chains, right? And this is the phenylalanine, what you see. So this is the phenylalanine ring and then it is connected to the main chain. So uh, all these pictures are also being provided by the Professor S. P. Kanojia. And uh, these are the tyrosine, what you see and so on, okay. So now in the, in the next step is that where you are actually going to do the model building is that looking at the electron density map, you have to place the protein sequence and that is how you are actually going to refine the structure and based on the using the information from the electron density map. So that is what you are going to do when you are going to do the model building and refinement. So you are actually going to uh, you know fit the uh, protein side chain into the this electron density map then you are actually going to calculate whether the uh, whether the structure is uh, 
having the more uh, error or less error and that would be one of the guiding force to tell you whether you are doing a solution correct or not right so that's how you are actually going to get the uh, final structure so this is actually a final structure the 3d model of the uh, protein and what you are going to get after uh, the structure solution using the x-ray crystallography so this is all about the x-ray crystallography what we have discussed right so we have discussed about the crystallization process and once you got the crystallization you are actually going to use that for collecting the diffraction data and then subsequent to that you are going to do the structure solution and the model building and refinements and at the end you are going to get the protein structure using this approach now let's move on to the second approach and the second approach is the protein uh, structure solution by the nmr spectroscopy so uh, let's discuss about what is nmr spectroscopy so what is nmr spectroscopy it's, it's measure the set of distance set between the atomic nuclei so remember there is a clear cut difference between the x-ray crystallography and the nmr spectroscopy nmr is more about so see if you see the atom right so you and in the atom you're going to have the electrons right on the periphery right so it's going to for example you have the electrons and then in the center you are going to have the nucleus right so if you are actually going to study the nucleus then it is actually going to call as nmr spectroscopy if you're going to study the nuclear electrons then it is actually going to use the x-ray crystallography because x-ray is actually going to you know uh, having the wavelength which is actually going to uh, you know activate or can going to be hit the electrons whereas in the nmr you are actually going to study the nucleus so you are actually going to measure the distances between the two nuclei for example you can have the hydrogen nuclei you can have the nitrogen nuclei and so on so you might have seen the structure different structures of the amino acids right so if you are mapping with the x-ray crystallography you will be able to see the arrangement of the electrons right that's how you are generating the electron density map whereas in the case of nmr you are actually going to see the differences or distances between the nuclei uh, why we perform the nmr spectroscopy right we perform the nmr spectroscopy because the crystallization is very difficult in some of the cases the protein structure is dynamically so unstable that it does not form a single conformation so it does not get stabilized into a single conformation so in those kind of cases it you are always going to get either the amorphous uh, powder or precipitate or in some cases you are going to get the crystal but those crystals are actually going to have the very high uh, degree of mosaicity or disorderness or they are actually going to form the crystal but they may not diffract so either of these method either of these problems whether the protein is not forming the crystals or protein is forming the crystal but they are not giving you a very high resolution diffractions you have no choice but to use the nmr spectroscopy to uh, solve the protein structures then the second advantage is that when you solve the protein structure with the help of the nmr you since the nmr is going to be performed into the buffer or the water you can also be able to study the protein dynamics because they are free to move see compared to the x-ray crystallography where the structures are going to be uh, rigid or they will stick to each other they are not allowed to move uh, nmr is going to be done in the solution right and they are so the proteins are free to move and that's why you are can be able to study the dynamics for example if you add the substrate to the protein right it is going to change the conformations so those conformations can be mapped with the help of the nmr spectroscopy so i have given you a reference uh, for uh, the protein nmr spectroscopy as well and you can be able to study or you can be able to read all of these steps what are we are going to discuss uh, now onwards from this particular uh, review articles so what are the different steps in the nmr spectroscopy so the first step is the protein purification the second step is the nmr spectroscopy data collections the third step is the sequential resonance assignment 
and the fourth step is the collection of the conformational constraints and the fifth step is the structure calculations. Remember that it is written as structure calculation rather than determinations because in the case of NMR you always going to calculate the structure right. So in first step is the protein purifications. So when you talk about the protein purifications the requirement for the NMR spectroscopy is also a highly purified protein. It is a highly purified protein you require so that the other proteins or other kind of molecules should not interfere in producing the NMR data. Uh, since the structures are going to be determined in the solution phase, right? Uh, you require the protein content that is from 300 to 600 microliter and the protein concentration should be in the 0.1 to 0.3 millimolar and the purified protein is usually dissolved in a buffer solutions. Then we the second step, uh, second step is about the NMR spectroscopy data collection. So each distinct nuclei produces a chemical shift by which it can be recognized. For example, you can have the uh, uh, speak uh, for nitrogen, you can have for hydrogen, you can have for phosphorus, you can have for sulfur and so on. So all these are going to be collected with the help of the uh, different types of NMR probes. For example, nitrogen probes, hydrogen probes, phosphorus probe, uh, sulfur probes and so on. Then you can also have the overlapping chemical shift. So one where you have the magnetization is transferred to the chemical bond and one where the transfer is through the space. Then you have the third step and the third step is uh, the sequential resonance assignments, right? So you can map the chemical shift to the atom by the sequential walking, right? And with the multi dimensional NMR spectroscopy, one can develop general strategies for the assignments, right? You can actually be able to use not only the nitrogen uh, probe or you can use phosphorus, sulfur and all that. So a combination is actually going to give you more uh, complicated multi dimensional NMR spectra and that actually can be used to assign the different peaks. If the protein sequence is known, it helps in mapping the chemical shift and as well as the assignments. The assignments of the interatomic distances are based on the proton-proton uh, NOE and it is time consuming, right? So structural calculation and NOE assignment is a iterative process. Just like as we were discussing about the X-ray crystallography, the NMR spectra solution is also like that. If you have to first assign the peaks, you have to assign the peaks like nitrogen, ammonia, like that. And if that is correct, it will actually going to make the structure more reliable. So that's how you are going to reduce the R factors. Then we have the fourth step is the collection of conformational constraints. So geometric conformational informative derived from the NMR data, you can actually have the distance restraints, you can have the restraint angles and you can have the orientation restraints. So all these are very important uh, for seeing that the protein is, is you know, structurally uh, come, uh, stable and it is actually going to have the distance restraints, right, restraint angle and orientation restraints. So all these are very, very important. Then you can have the chemical shift data given from the secondary structures. Then we can also have the last step that is the structural cal calculations. So using the computer programs, the analysis of the chemical shift and the different types of resistance allow us to deduce the inner symbols of the structure. Remember that the NMR is going to do the protein structure determination in the solution, right? So in the solution, some uh, structure is going to be uh, one conformation, the other structures are going to be second conformation and so on. So that's why it is actually going to deduce the symbols of the structure, which means it is going to give you a average structure of that particular protein at that particular moment because average structure may change if you change the conditions and that's how it is actually going to use for studying the dynamics, right? So if you add, for example, if we take the enzyme, right, and if you add the substrate, enzyme is going to be enzyme prime because it is actually going to induce the conformational changes and that's how the average structure for this and average structure is this is going to be changed and that's how you can be able to detect at which portion of the protein is actually responding to the substrate addition and how that particular portion is determining the uh, structure solution or uh, en enzyme catalysis.
Similarly, E prime uh, probably can uh, you know uh, go back to the E or it can actually be go to the E prime, the double prime actually when the product is actually going to be released. So these kind of uh, NMR is a very, very robust technique, right? Uh, to actually see that you are actually going to study all these events like where you can actually be able to see the conformational changes in the enzyme structures when the substrate is binding and you can also be able to see the changes when the product is getting released. Either it is going to adopt the original conformation or it can actually be able to adopt the other conformation as well. Now, once you solve the structure, uh, either by the X-ray crystallography or the NMR spectroscopy, you have to define uh, or you have to determine whether the structure what I have solved is of good quality or not, right? So what are the parameters for the structural quality? So the first parameter is the R factor. So R factor is a measure of the agreement between the crystallographic model and the original X-ray diffractive data. It means it is R factor is used to assess the progress of the structure refinement and the final R factor is on a is, is, uh, is one which we measure the model quality which means R factor is actually going to decide uh, the quality of the structure. You can have the free R factor. So it is used in the cross validation or the quality control process of assessing the agreement between the calculated and the observed data. The free R factor is computed in the same manner as the R factor, but usually only a small set of randomly chosen instances which are set aside from the beginning and not used during the refinements. Okay. So the other quantity used for the structure qualities are RSR, R merge and R sim to describe the internal agreement of the measurement in a crystallographic data set. Now the parameters for structure quality for the NMR spectroscopy. So you can have the first parameter that is called as the knowledge based quality measures. So knowledge based matrices describe how well the structure model confers to the expectations. Which means you are going to see the bond length and the bond angle. You remember that transcendent plot, right? So that is very important to satisfy the structure what you have solved by the NMR spectroscopy. Then you also have the uh, dihedral angle distributions, atomic packing and the hydrogen bonding matrices. So that is also very important. Then you can also have the second uh, parameter that is the model versus the data measurements, right? So what model you have prepared and what the data is suggesting in terms of model is also very important. So the most general form of model versus data validation involves the comparison of the distances and the dihedral angle in model with the corresponding experimental restraints. The model versus data measurements are used widely with NMR to assess the structure quality. So this is all about the protein structure determination. So we have what we have discussed so far, we have discussed about the experimental procedures and in that discuss while discussing about the experimental procedure, we discuss about the two methods. We have discussed about the uh, two situ in under two situations in one situation when you can be able to produce the crystals, you are actually going to use the X-ray crystallography to solve the protein structures. And in the second step, uh, second process, you can be able to use the, uh, you can be able to use the NMR spectroscopy and both of these methods are actually going to give you the uh, protein structures. Now the question comes, what is the difference between the protein structure solution either by the X-ray crystallography or the NMR spectroscopy? So what is the advantage and what are the disadvantages when you are going to use the X-ray versus NMR? So X-ray, so what are the difference? In the X-ray, X-ray is going to give you a solid structure or I will say the structure under the uh, static conditions. So it, it is actually going to give you the static structure, which means that structure is not going to change. It is going to be final conformation. Whereas in the case of NMR, it is actually going to give you a dynamic structure. Now, because it gives the dynamic structure, so it is actually going to give you a, 
solution structure so it's called as solution structures why it is so because the static structure is coming from the crystal right whereas the dynamic structure is coming from the aqueous solution of the protein number 2 in the case of x ray you require the crystal right so it, that is a major uh, drawback or i will say disadvantage because you producing the crystal of a protein is not uh, very trivial right because uh, and whereas the nmr there is no such requirement okay number 3 x ray is going to give you a high resolution structure nmr is going to give you average structure okay number 4 x ray is going to freeze the conformations right because it is going to give you the static structure so that is good to study the final uh, uh, conformation or final uh, changes in the protein structure whereas in the case of nmr because it is going to give you the dynamic structure it can be used very extensively in terms of the uh, studying the conformations of the protein in response to substrate or product or inhibitor so or in some cases it can be also study to you know change uh, see the conformation of the protein structure even when the you are adding the another protein so to which the previous protein is interacting okay so what we have discussed uh, in this particular uh, lecture we have discussed about the protein structure and uh, uh, we have discussed we have taken the two approaches one is called as the experimental approach so where we have discussed about the x ray crystallography and as well as the nmr spectroscopy and both of these approaches can be used to study the protein structures when we were discussing about the crystallization we discuss about the hanging drop method and as well as the sitting drop method subsequent to that we have also discussed about the how you can be able to use the data collections so when we are doing the data collections we can also be able to do the mounting mounting into the capillary or mounting into the loop and then subsequent to that we have also discussed about the data collection x ray diffraction patterns and structure solutions and the model building and refinements uh we also discuss about what are the different parameters you can use for uh, you know calculating the errors into the solved structures and how you can be able to uh, assess whether the structure what you have solved is of good quality or not and uh, when we are talking about the nmr spectroscopy we have discussed about the different steps how we can be able to Uh, you know collect the diffraction uh, collect the nmr spectroscopy data how you can be able to assign the different peaks and so on and uh, lastly we have also discussed about the uh, how we can be able to assess the uh, quality of the nmr uh, structure from the nmr and at the end we have also given you a comparison of the two techniques so that you can be able to know what are the robustness of one technique and what are the advantage of the other techniques so with this i would like to conclude my lecture here in our subsequent lecture we are going to discuss more about the non experimental procedures which means we are going to use we are going to discuss about the computational approaches and how you can be able to model a protein structure uh, using the molecular modeling approach so with this i would like to conclude my lecture here thank you mm -hmm.